Hang on. We're going to the Pentagon. Never mind. And to bring our brave service members home. From Kabul to Kandahar and from Mosul to Fallujah, hundreds of thousands of America's finest sons and daughters who selflessly answered the call to serve in the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard have brought us to this point. Their efforts and sacrifice will go down in history as epitomizing the strength, commitment, and empathy of a force that is unlike any the world has ever seen. Just last night, I joined Vice President Mike Pence and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Milley, to attend the dignified transfer of five American soldiers who perished on duty in the Middle East. This was a somber and humbling moment that reminded us of the tremendous sacrifices made by the men and women of the United States military in service of freedom and security. Our armed forces take an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. They serve not for personal gain, but for the protection and well-being of their fellow Americans and their homeland. They are champions for peace, liberty, and the rule of law, and unrelenting when called upon to defend our people and our values. We owe them and their loved ones an enormous debt of gratitude. This is why I'm enormously blessed and privileged to stand before you today to outline the next phase of our campaign to defeat terrorists who have perpetrated attacks on our homeland, including those who help and harbor them, and to prevent, prevent future acts of terrorism against our nation. We owe this moment to the many patriots who made the ultimate sacrifice and their comrades who carry forward their legacy. Together, we have mourned the loss of more than 6,900 American troops who gave their lives in Afghanistan and Iraq. And we will never forget the more than 52,000 who bear the wounds of war and all those who still carry its scars, visible and invisible. In light of these tremendous sacrifices, and with great humility and gratitude to those who came before us, I am formally announcing that we will implement President Trump's orders to continue our repositioning of forces from those two countries. By January 15, 2001, excuse me, I clearly am thinking of where this started in 2001. By January 15, 2021, our forces, their size in Afghanistan, will be 2,500 troops. Our force size in Iraq will also be 2,500 by that same date. This is consistent with our established plans and strategic objectives, supported by the American people, and does not equate to a change in U.S. policy or objectives. Moreover, this decision by the President is based on continuous engagement with his National Security Cabinet over the past several months, including ongoing discussions with me and my colleagues across the United States government. I have also spoken with our military commanders, and we all will execute this repositioning in a way that protects our fighting men and women, our partners in the intelligence community and diplomatic corps, and our superb allies that are critical to rebuilding Afghan and Iraqi security capabilities and civil society for a lasting peace in troubled lands. And just this morning, I spoke with key leaders in Congress, as well as our allies and partners abroad, to update them on these plans in light of our shared approach. We went in together, we adjust together, and when the time is right, we will leave together. One of my calls was to NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg, Another was to Afghanistan's President Ghani, who expressed his gratitude for every American service member who has fought for peace and strengthened the longstanding friendship between our countries. President Ghani highlighted the caliber of our troops, which he noted has always been more important than the quantity. We continue to stand with him as his government works toward a negotiated settlement for peace. Meanwhile, 
Let us remind those who question our resolve or may seek to interfere with this prudent, well-planned, and coordinated transition. The United States Armed Forces remain committed to protecting the safety and security of the American people and supporting our like-minded allies and partners worldwide. If the forces of terror, instability, division, and hate begin a deliberate campaign to disrupt our efforts, we stand ready to apply the capabilities required to thwart them. As a veteran whose life and family was irrevocably changed in the deserts, mountains, and cities of Iraq and Afghanistan, along with the hundreds of thousands of U.S. troops who have fought there and were forever transformed by their experiences, I celebrate this day as we continue the President's consistent progress in completing the mission we began nearly two decades ago. I want to thank the Afghans and Iraqis who have partnered with us throughout and who now carry the bulk of the fighting to secure their homelands. I want to thank our NATO allies and other partners who have fought alongside us and taken the lead on training and advising the Afghan and Iraqi security forces. We will continue to support their efforts. And thanks to our more than 80 partners in the Defeat ISIS coalition, we have destroyed the ISIS caliphate and will ensure they never again gain a foothold to attack our people. In closing, we set out to accomplish three goals in 2001. First, go abroad and destroy terrorists, their organizations, and their sanctuaries. Two, strengthen our defenses against future attacks. And three, prevent the continued growth of Islamist terrorism to include by working with allies and local partners to take the lead in the fight. Today is another critical step in that direction and a result of President Trump's bold leadership. With the blessings of Providence in the coming year, we will finish this generational war and bring our men and women home. We will protect our children from the heavy burden and toll of perpetual war. And we will honor the sacrifices made in service to peace and stability in Afghanistan, Iraq, and around the world, and celebrate all those who helped us secure freedom over oppression. God bless our women and men in uniform. Thank you very much. Can you tell us why you're not going to take any questions? Mr. Secretary, Secretary you're in the yes. strength of the hand of the Taliban. Talk to the crowd and and more time time questions. questions. Right, so we've had a formal announcement there from the Pentagon that uh, two and a half thousand troops uh, will remain in Afghanistan and Iraq in uh, January of next year. So that's in just a couple of months' time. Now, uh, reports suggest that this decision was opposed by top military officials. Of course, a decision that would have been approved by uh, U.S. President Donald Trump was actually opposed by senior military leaders and senior officials, uh, particularly in Afghanistan, given that there is a very sensitive situation there with ongoing uh, talks and negotiations taking place between the Taliban and the Afghan government. Now, those talks have faced uh, a number of obstacles. In fact, they've pretty much ground to a halt in stalemate, but at the same time, uh, violent attacks in Afghanistan are on the rise. So there has been some concern about what a troop withdrawal, about the effect that it could have on the country. But, of course, President Trump did campaign on ending the U.S. military presence abroad in Iraq and Afghanistan. He campaigned on that pledge in 2016. And uh, of this, uh, this troop withdrawal comes at the end of his time in power. So let's speak to our White House correspondent, Kimberly Halkett, in Washington. Uh, now, what's been the reaction there, Kimberly, particularly among Pentagon officials and... Uh, Republicans in Congress. Yeah, this was anticipated and already in advance of this announcement, there was pushback because uh, top Republicans, including Mitch McConnell, the top Republican in the U.S. Senate, saying that this is really going to affect not only the ongoing peace efforts and negotiations in Afghanistan with regard to the Taliban, uh, of course, those negotiations taking place in Doha, but also uh, the fact that there is uh, concern this could affect U.S. national security in terms of its counterterrorism efforts. 
Arabs. We should also point out that this is some of the same advice that was given to the U.S. president uh, from top officials in the Pentagon. But what's notable about this is the fact that the president just last week, in fact, put in place a number of loyalists at the Pentagon in order to push this through that uh, share his thinking, this perpetual war, as you heard discussed there. This is something, as you mentioned, that Donald Trump campaigned on in 2016, ending these endless wars, as he called them. But even his critics will note that this announcement falls short of that goal as well. So it appears the president trying to make good on that, but not quite meeting the mark. Because as we heard there, while there is going to be a reduction in forces, this is not a complete withdrawal. This will still have a, a small troop pre presence in terms of numbers uh, in Iraq as well as Afghanistan. So this is going to be met with a lot of criticism because uh, it doesn't seem to please the Pentagon officials. It doesn't please the politicians on Capitol Hill. And it also falls short of what the president promised to voters back four years ago. Right. So why the rush to go ahead with this? Well, it's clear that the president is trying to sort of preserve his legacy, if you will. He's thinking about what he can do in the final days. But some might argue that what this is going to do is leave President-elect Biden, who will become the new commander-in-chief, with a bit of a conundrum in terms of moving forward. This could exacerbate the situation on the ground and, and lead to having to bring troops back. Uh, this is something that the American public may not have the appetite for not only because of the heavy toll in terms of uh, casualties, whether it be those that have been injured or have lost their lives in the tens of thousands, or just the sheer price tag, given the fact that the United States is in economic trouble due to COVID-19. There simply isn't the funding that was available a generation ago when all of this started. So uh, this is certainly going to leave the U.S. Uh, president uh, incoming. Joe Biden uh, with a bit of a, a problem on his hands. So many people wondering if this is even vindictive in nature. But uh, the president has said he's very supportive of the troops. He said even before the U.S. election in October that he hoped to have uh, soldiers home by Christmas time. And it appears he is at least portraying this as a goodwill gesture. Whether or not it is of strategic interest is one that will certainly be debated for days to come in Washington. Thanks very much. From Washington, D.C., Kimberly Halkett, our White House correspondent. Simona Fulton joins us live now from the Iraqi capital, Baghdad. And as Kimberly was saying there, national security officials voicing their concern about the impact it could have on Iraq, and, and uh, particularly as we saw in 2011 when U.S. troops pulled out, uh, uh, the feeling is that that sort of vacuum led to the rise of, of ISIS. So even if this decision doesn't have much of an effect on the ground, it does send a strong political message. Well, actually, the, the announcement is not that significant in light of the drawdown that already happened over the past few months. If we go back to earlier this year, there were 5,000 U.S. troops stationed uh, in Iraq. That number has uh, gone down to 3,000 as of September this year. And those reductions took place in the wake of a parliamentary vote here in Iraq to, uh, to oust all of the foreign troops following the U.S. assassination of uh, Iranian General Qasem Soleimani, uh, as well as Iraqi officials. And of course, it was because of the coronavirus uh, pandemic. So decreasing the troops from 3,000 to 2,500 uh, is not uh, that uh, big of a step, really, but uh, it remains to be seen what the impact will be on the U.S.-led coalition here because, of course, the U.S. troops make up the biggest bulk of the coalition. They provide intelligence, they provide air support and surveillance. They also have a small uh, contingent of special forces that uh, sometimes accompany uh, Iraqi troops on operations against uh, ISIL. And, of course, they also provide an important logistical backbone and force protection for uh, the other member countries. So uh, we have to wait for the reaction of the other coalition members and, of course, of uh, Iraqi government officials to see what uh, the reaction might be. But um, with regard to what you mentioned about 2011, we, are, uh, we, we have a very different situation on the ground uh, in Iraq today. In 2011, there was a different government in place. The U.S. troops played a much more important role at that time. Their number was 150,000. I can hear you. Can you hear me? 
are uh, much more capable um, in carrying out their mandate. So even if uh, the, the troops were to leave ent entirely, then it's, uh, it's, it's uncertain whether that would have the same impact in uh, creating the security vacuum that we saw uh, in 2011. But of course, any kind of drawdown in U.S. troops will impact the coalition partners and will, of course, lead, uh, for example, some of the US European countries to reconsider whether their military presence in Iraq is sustainable. All right. Thanks very much. Apologies for the, the quality of the sound.